Okay, um, again, thought we'd have a little bit of fun. Uh, these guys have been working extensively in designing, developing, uh, coding, and let's be honest, they're just hacking apps that run on top of open daylight. So we thought it'd be a great opportunity to uh, uh, listen to um, you know, what they've done, some of their observations, uh, uh, you know, bearing all warts and uh, whatnot. So, um, in the first spot, we have Giles Heron, uh, longtime industry figure. He's worked at service provider. He's been at, been at Cisco for a few years. We have Bimmo Grewal, who's a uh, student on loan from the University of Kent, yeah. and uh, he has been creating uh, or doing some fantastic work on user interfaces uh, for many of the applications. We have Nicholas Montine, um, who's been a longtime uh, senior engineer and uh, more recently has been. Um, working on some of the back-end capabilities of, uh, of some of these applications. Yure Sieben uh, done tremendous work uh, in creating uh, an open flow application as well as working with Yang models and perhaps visualizing those. And then finally we have Andrew McLaughlin um, who's also done some outstanding work in adding some capabilities to open daylight. So um, I'm just going to start lobbing some of these softballs that we agreed that we'd uh, talk about uh, to get things warmed up and uh, take it from there. So, um, Giles, uh, oh, and by the way, all these applications that we're going to describe and talk about, they are running, they're all running code, and they are available to take a look at in some of the pods over here. Um, you might have heard of what Dave Clark said many years ago about the uh, about the spirit behind what goes on in the IETF, right? Rough consensus and running code. Well, I'm going to just flip that around a bit and call it uh, running code and the rest is nonsense. <laughs> All right, so um, Giles, uh, sure. you know, you've got, a lot of in, you've got a lot of buddies in the service provider space and at the IETF. How are they taking to this notion of SDN that's based on software and engin software engineering? Uh, first, first, I'd like to clarify that was not a softball question. We agreed, but there you go, Chris. Thanks for that. So I'm going to have to think on my feet. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's one of these things. It's a journey for all of us. Um, I think you know we all started out with CLI, and you know that's how we've done always done things. But I think what we're seeing in the ITF is a massive move towards Yang modeling, for example. It's just like everybody and their brothers writing Yang models because everyone sees that's the way the way things are going now. Um, you know, API-driven stuff with SDN controllers. It is the future. Um, and yeah, the ITF's on board with that, but you know, frankly, they're not, they're not cranking out models fast enough, and that's one of the great things about working in open daylight. You know, we're not constrained by that process. So we've got, I think it's, yeah, what is it, like 500 models now in lithium? It's some crazy number, yeah, really Indeed, yeah, no, yeah, there are, there are quite a few. Uh, Yure, you've built a UI based on Yang models that are loaded up into open daylight, and your UI consumes them. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that and uh, what the value of that application uh, is. Uh, so as Chris said, this UI process the Yang models that are in uh, ODL uh, dynamically and then generates the UI. And the added value is to help basically developers or, or to people who wants to get into the SDN or open daylight to uh, visualize and, be uh, and to better understand how the Yang models are structurized and, and how are they working, what set of data they can accept, what set of data they cannot accept, and so on. Uh, we were talking earlier about some of the uh, transformations between Yang models to something that can be rendered by some of the web UI frameworks. Uh, describe what you're using inside your application to, to accomplish that. Uh, well, currently we are working with AngularJS as basic framework, and also we we, we made an, another application that uh, the, that display that is displaying these Yang models in some uh, graph graph form. So, so so it's 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 another tool to help developers to better visualize the Yang models. And for that, we are using Sigma.js, which is based on the free library. Right. Yeah, these, these are all open source uh, components. I guess what I was really getting at is uh, to take some of those Yang models. I think you're using PYang as a way to do that conversion so you can eventually get it into JSON. Well, uh, 
in, in the start, we, we were using PYANG, but now there is functionality in ODL uh, that is exposing the Yang, Yang models in in form, which is basically XML uh, with the REST API. So we, we are just calling these REST APIs to get the XMLs. Very good. Hey, these applications might typically contain a user or a front end, a user interface, uh, you know, something that the operator or end user can see. The application may also contain a back end. Uh, Nicholas, you've done the back end for the PSET manager that's uh, going to be on the open SDN controller. Tell us a little bit about what you use to set that up. Right. Uh, yeah, first, uh, I was looking at uh, creating a, a demo setup with uh, Open Daylight. And I saw the interface, and it looked fairly easy to, to work with. So uh, I started building a small Python app that could create paths across the network from one point to another. And then I realized that, well, I could build a path calculation engine that could figure out all possible paths from A to B. And uh, got that one working. And of course, uh, CLI is not a great uh, UI. So I called Chris and said, hey, do you have someone that can help me with to put a UI on top of this backend? And um, that's how we build the, the PSAP managers. So it's basically three parts. It's the calculation engine. It's the open daylight or open SDN controller interface. And then the UI interface. So, so basically, there, there are two REST interfaces. There's a REST command between the UI and the back end, and then the back end and open daylight. Right, so there's usually a couple of pieces with these applications. Now, Bimmel has done quite a few UIs for many of the applications. Uh, Bimmel, what, what have you used to create some of these uh, user interfaces? Um, I have used um, a few uh, UI frameworks. One is Next, uh, which is Cisco's own uh, UI framework that I used. Uh, to which, by the way, just a quick plug, I think there was an announcement today about an SDK that's available for Next. So it's a real nice UI framework. It's got an excellent topology tool. Yeah, it's Next UI is used to visualize uh, the network uh, mm -hmm. using the cool uh, interface that sits on top of it uh, to actually visualize the network. And the second uh, UI framework that I used was Deluxe, which uh, Yuri is part of. He's one of the developers of Deluxe UI framework. And that's based on Angular. Those are the two interface uh, frameworks that I've used. And all you need is pretty much HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, not even too much JavaScript, a little bit of, if you know basic JavaScript, you're ready to go. And you can start building uh, applications on top of ODL. It's do, really they, do they te uh, typically teach you about those programming yeah. languages in yeah. university? So, yeah. so you, can t you, can be, you can come out of there um, pretty yeah. well schooled up on yeah. uh, JavaScript? Right. Yep. Yeah, for example, Deluxe, yeah, straight. So HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, they teach you. And, uh, and so if you want to get started, you can uh, read up Deluxe wiki page to get started. It's really rapid. So. Right, right. Hey, uh, Andrew, you've got a pretty neat application that leverages a message bus or pub sub capability in open daylight, but then you also had something going on with XMPP. Why don't you briefly describe that? Because XMPP is not something that you typically read about uh, working within this open daylight or even SDN environment. Yeah, thank you, Chris. It's we've been looking at kind of network management as a you know something we could do differently. We we see a lot of requests from customers to kind of start flipping it around to a pub sub model. So we really needed to implement some sort of message bus, uh, which we're really calling a topic broker, into uh, Open Daylight. So we've kind of glued this together with some example code for XMPP. So we can make a very simple subscription into Open Daylight for say syslog uh, out of a device. We encapsulate that over NetConf notifications, and XMPP is kind of one of our example plugins. But yeah, we kind of get a lot of requests for real simple stuff, like we need a connector, like XMPP, or we want to get to you know, WSO2, and we really want to move to a sort of pub-sub model for doing this. And, and we get some great leverage out of, of Open Daylight for that. Indeed. So, so uh, Andrew, I also wanted to ask you, given your service provider background, are these guys buying into SDN? I, I, th I think so, and, and actually from the folks I've spoken to today, so, so are the enterprise guys. I mean, we're seeing more and more people coming along saying, I, I need to develop applications, I need data out of the network, and I don't want to see it in a network format, I don't want to learn BGP. You know, these are you know, guys like Bimmel, who are you know, coming out of university, doing some great work with small apps to solve problems. But 
we're also just beginning to see the bigger apps beginning to emerge now as well. But based on the same principles, you know, we want to see data, we want to see structured data, mm -hmm. and, and, and we need a controller or some sort of layer that's not networked to, to enable us to do this. So, right, yeah, right, right. definitely. Hey, uh, Giles, you've worked with um, ODL, obviously, but also incorporating some other platforms. Uh, maybe you, you, utilizing these platforms that can accomplish things that maybe ODL can't. Um, why don't you describe a, a couple that you've been working with? Gosh, yeah. So and also the effort involved to sort of get these uh, two things to work together. Yeah, I mean, that's been one, uh, one of the interesting things we've done recently is working with ODL and with NCS, uh, which was part of the TLF acquisition. Uh, one of the cool things there is that NCS can expose a NetConf Yang interface northbound, uh, which ODL can then hook into. Um, and I guess what NCS gives you is, I guess, a couple of different things. One is the ability to speak to devices that have CLI and don't yet have NetConf Yang for configuration. The other thing it has is a great service modeling capability so that you can basically model your service as a single transaction that you want to apply to the network. And it will handle commit and rollback and all that sort of thing across multiple devices. And I think, you know, as a, as a developer, um, that's just an immense productivity gain. So from the old days of writing expect scripts, there's a lot of effort in parsing stuff. And then also the problem of what do I do if this device is OK and that device isn't? You kind of just hand all that over to the platform. And that really speeds things up. So uh, I guess a lot of these platforms uh, expose REST APIs, but Giles just talked about NetConf. Um, do you think application developers will have to sort of get into that to some degree? Or, uh, and also a uh, follow-up question, what about Yang models? I know you mentioned yeah, that earlier. Yeah. So I, I don't think for the app developers that's really something to worry about too much. I mean, one of the great things in Open Daylight is the straight pass-through you have from RESTConf which can use either JSON or XML and you know, using HTTP and effectively translate that straight through into NetConf Yang. So you hide the complexities of the protocol. And I think to me that's one of the big things that SCN controllers give you is abstracting you away from the syntax of the underlying protocols, whether it's NetConf or BGP or whatever. Um, the other thing they give you is some semantic change. So you can start to think about the network as a whole rather than thinking necessarily about individual components. Right, very good. Hey, um, a lot of people sometimes think that these development environments require, you know, uh, big old servers in some uh, closet or a basement somewhere. Bimmel, you've done a lot of uh, rapid fire development for user interfaces. Uh, why don't you tell the folks what you use um, to get things going, to test, to develop, and then test your application? Uh, so, I mean, as far as the user interface goes uh, for ODO apps, the only thing uh, that you use to actually um, to talk to ODO is REST APIs, and uh, which is just a simple HTTP request, and you get the data back as JSON, and which JavaScript natively supports. Uh, and that's all I've got to really test, uh, really. And I test that using Postman. And uh, what, what's your back end or your REST server that you can place uh, on yeah, your laptop? So, uh, if it's Node, uh, sometimes sometimes it's uh, Tornado if it's Python. Right. What did you, what did you use, uh, Nicholas? Uh, I used uh, an op a um, dcloud demo. So if you go to dcloudcisco.com, there are open daylight demos or open SDN controller demos. So I basically fired up a demo uh, that gives me a router network, an eight node topology network. It has uh, a REST interface, and I can program it and send commands directly from my laptop to it. Right. Uh, follow up question What about uh, some of the virtualization tools that you use within the cloud environment? Uh, yeah, well, the, the topology is built on viral. So virtual internet routing labs or uh, Cisco modeling labs. It's a great tool to, uh, to get started uh, easily. It's small topology or large topology. Very good. Hey, um, we were using the Next UI framework for a while, then we got into some of the open source um, tools supported by Deluxe. Yure, you worked with both. Uh, can you compare and contrast Next versus the Deluxe UI frameworks? Well, uh... As Bimo said, Next framework has very good topology component. And for what I can say, this topology component is superior to any other open source topology component that I have exper so, experienced so far. But uh, as, as the other part goes, like the standard Next framework, we are currently using Angular. And it, it has some, 
some plus and minuses. Uh, Ang Angular, of course, is a little bit like, more more robust. It, it's it's it, you can automate a lot of things with it, which is of course good and bad thing because if you automate something, you have to write less code, but you lose control over the over the things. And the, if you don't know how how exactly the Angular works, it it can lead leads to some pitfalls that you can spend days debugging. And 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 but but but. Uh, how many uh, days, Yuri? You, we we have to get this done, right? So. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it it can be like once we dealt with some problem, we we took I, I think week or something like that. And but 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 if you if you really get into it, you 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 are able to. Or, or as if I speak for myself, you are able to. Uh, Develop application quicker with right. Angular than with than with Next. Right, Pimo, you, uh, you work with uh, Angular JS. Uh, easy? Uh, is there a learning curve? Or uh... yeah, um, not too hard. Uh, if you have done considerable amount of programming JavaScript before, raw JavaScript, then Angular JS is not hard to pick up at all. Uh, but yeah, deluxe framework. Even the frameworks themselves, they're not hard to use once you have set them up. But initially, to set them up, they can be really painful, right. especially Deluxe, because uh, there are no uh, instructions, steps of instructions 1 to 10 that you can follow. Uh, you got to go on one link, and it takes you to another link. You go, it takes you to another link, and then you have to talk to people like you, Ray, talk to Harmon. Uh, to get things working. And right, so there's some nice collaboration between yeah. your uh, engineering peers. Yeah, and then uh, once it gets going, it's really fast. Right, yeah. right. Andrew, you've done some great work in packaging up ODL with a couple of uh, virtual routers. Why don't you tell the folks, you know, how big that is and what you need to run it on a particular lap yeah. laptop, you know, the profile, memory, that sort of thing. So yeah, as you were saying, things like viral are great because you can spin up really big environments and you know we have dcloud to do that on. But we have a lot of folks who travel or just want to work from home. So we really needed a much smaller environment. So we've been using just very simple VMware technology or VirtualBox and have just produced a very small package with a couple of XRV routers in. Open Daylight's in there, we put all the build, build tools in and, and you know we find people download that and they just get up and running like straight away. So it's it's you know it's classic sort of VM thing. Need about eight gig of RAM because obviously XR just consumes a couple of gig. You can run one or two in that, but you can get plenty of RAM for running ODL, for building your apps, building your environment. And uh, yeah, we've, it, it just keeps getting downloaded. People are people still using it. So, but it's simple. That's the main thing about it. Right. Who have you handed it out to? Uh, other Cisco colleagues? It's uh, gone, gone to a lot of Cisco folks. In fact, just seeing even SEs are starting to download it now because they just they want to play, they want to see the environment, and they can show it to customers. Right. So, what about, uh, do you need, can you run it on Windows, or do you need a VMware, a, a virtual it, it, uh, nothing, nothing machine? Nothing proprietary. Kind of it runs on Windows, runs on Linux, runs on Mac. You can right. just It's a VM, so everything you need is just in it. Right. Uh, logistical question. Uh, how many monitors do you guys use when you're coding? Giles? <laughs> Two. <laughs> Two? Bimmel? Uh, two. Nicholas, I know you have a few. What, how many? Well, two, two big ones. Two big ones, right. You're right, what about you? Two, two. Andrew? It's two. Yeah. Okay, so it's always two. Always two. Um, <laughs> Jaws, last night we were talking about IDEs, um, mm -hmm. your observations there. Yeah, just not, I mean, I'm not by background a Java coder, but um, one thing I found a little tricky initially with Open Daylight is this whole thing of how did I find stuff, because you tend to find with Java everything is buried under about you know, 20 levels of directory structure. I think that's where a lot of the IDs take some of that pain away from you, so you know, Eclipse, IntelliJ, things like that. Sorry, Otherwise, you end well, up doing a lot of recursive grepping, basically. Well, I'm sorry, what was that again? What were the tools? Eclipse, IntelliJ, right. those were the two main ones. What do you me. use, Bimmel? Um, Sublime Text works. <laughs> uh, brackets is another one. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. Nicholas? Uh, I use Xcode on uh, a Mac for, for Python. Right. Yuri? Uh, I use Sub Sublime Text too, and then uh, Chrome and Mozilla debuggers. Andrew? I'm old, Emacs, and right. Sublime, just to pretend to be new. Right. right. <laughs> um, talk about documentation. Uh, Giles, we'll start with you. Um, I think it's so key mm -hmm. when you're trying to create these apps to you know, understand what the APIs are, where they are, what they do. Mm -hmm. um, is it decent? Is it 
satisfactory? Does it leave a lot to be desired? I, th I think what we're finding is there's more and more documentation getting out there. I think the challenge is going to be to curate it a bit and kind of get a bit more structure. Even some of the better documented components of ODL, I, I find there's like 30 different links on the wiki and I'm never sure which one I'm meant to go to to find the thing I'm after. So I think with that that can improve. But I think in terms of the models, I think the, you know, documentation isn't the way forward. The way forward is the Yang UI tool. To just load the model up and look at it. Right. Um, and I guess the documentation or the tools have to also incorporate Yang. And I guess you were talking about yeah. that yesterday during your uh, tectorial. Uh, that's why uh, URA developed that Yang UI uh, and Yang Visualizer application. So I think the message there is that application developers will have to really start to uh, consume and understand uh, what Yang is, what it can do, and, and how it might work with some of these uh, different platforms. Yeah, yeah. And, and in some ways, I, I feel like Yang can also become the interface between the network guy and the, and the apps guy. Mm. But a lot of us as networking guys, you know, we're going to code in Python maybe, but we're not going to be hardcore developers typically. But if we can give someone almost a spec that is the Yang model and say, if, if you code this up and it works this way, that's going to be what I need. Right, right. Uh, Nicholas, uh, you've done tremendous work. I mean, you're, you're primarily using Python or exclusively Python uh, as your development uh, environment and your programming language? Uh, yes. Um, pros and cons? Um, well, uh, Python is great for JSON uh, struct data structures because it's basically just a dictionary. But XML is a pain, and uh, I hate XML. <laughs> it took me days to find a, uh, a couple of pagefuls of XML, yeah. Yeah. and there was a backslash N in the middle of it. Yeah. And it would just break. And uh, so if, if there's a list uh, you guys sign up against XML, I'll sign up there. Right, okay, all right. Can we start that maybe, uh, maybe at the next step? Python we'll programmers have, uh, against XML. Get rid of XML. Yeah. Uh, very good. Um, Yure, what? programming languages do you primarily uh, work with? Well, we are using JavaScript and the good thing is, it, is that you can do almost everything with JavaScript and the bad thing is that you can do almost everything with JavaScript. <laughs> so yeah. if you are not careful you can <laughs> screw your, yourself up. So, so uh, yeah, you, you need to be careful with JavaScript. Right. Right. Hey, um, there's engineers, software engineers all over the globe, and uh, a lot of what has to happen here, must happen, is collaboration between these engineers. Andrew, I know that you've worked with a number both in Europe and in the U.S. Um, has that worked out? What are some of the um, good points about that? Um, obviously, there's maybe several hassles. Uh, it's, I, I think uh, if we're talking about kind of the transition from the sort of network engineering point of view to, I think Giles mentioned it, the sort of handing off a model to, to someone to ultimately build an OSS or some application to run this. I think we saw yesterday in the talk, it was predominantly network engineers. So there's, there's an awful lot of interest from those guys who kind of know that CLI has been the bread and butter for many people for many years, but it, it, it's, on, it's on the wane because uh, it's not sustainable from an OSS point of view. So I think it's been fantastic to see how much response there's been for people actively wanting to learn new programming languages. They want to learn about models. And uh, I mean, I'm a network engineering guy, so you know, I've been learning Python. I, li I like it because it has a lot of libraries, so I can shortcut my learning and, and figure out how things work, and then you know, move into sort of you know more of a Java world. But I think you know, if I can do it, it's it's uh, it's got to be doable. <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's getting it's good. Obviously, we think there's a lot of value uh, using open source. Open Daylight is open source, and these guys have talked about a couple of uh, uh, components that are open source that we uh, incorporate. Giles, big picture, um, your colleagues in the industry, the IETF, um, what are their thoughts on open source? I, I mean, I think generally it's, um, it's where a lot of things are going, um, and I think you know, the question, I guess, is how far down the stack it's going to go. Um, but I think, you know, the controller layer, it just, just makes a whole lot of sense um, to open things up and let anybody work on it. Um, and I think, um, you know, I think people are also seeing the benefits of that open source, like, development model. You know, I'm back to saying, you know, we've got 500 Yang models out in ODL versus the rate. I think there's, like, seven or eight RFCs so far in the ITF for Yang models. So just people are seeing how that, that collaborative way of working really speeds things up. Right, just looking at our Steam panel here, I see Giles, Network Geek, Nicholas, Network Geek, Andrew, Network Geek, 
you're a Bimble, uh, predominantly uh, web UI guys. Um, thoughts on collaborating between these two worlds? I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Nicholas. Oh, for me? Yeah, uh, yeah it's, it works pretty well. Um, I, I mean, you I'm showed like, up in our office last year saying, I got this great back end yeah. doing, uh, you know, MPLST program, I need, I need a UI. Right, yeah. and because uh, I, I looked at the next UI and it wasn't simple for me. It looks pretty complex and it's Java, and I was not about to learn Java. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I think the interactions between me and uh, Tyler went really well. Right, uh, Bimo, you've done some nice work uh, with some of the folks in another BU, leveraging the platform that Giles described, and also working with some of the uh, um, our large routers. How has that collaboration gone? Um, it was pretty great. I mean, there's not much conflict because uh, because I was the only person working on the UI, so I didn't have to talk to anybody regarding the UI. So, I'm uh, shocked. I'm yeah, shocked. Yeah, you mean so, Cisco uh, doesn't do UIs? Yeah, because I was because like, I, like, I was the only one in charge, so I just had to talk to myself. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah. So the only person I had to talk to was um, the backend team to give me the REST APIs, and that was it, really. Right. Yeah. Uh, Yuri, we've uh, you know when we have designed yeah. some of these apps, we start with sort of low-level mockups um, and then take it from there. Thoughts or observations on the value of these? Uh, well, I think the best part uh, on, on using the this kind of approach of development is that uh, you can use the Yang models as like common inter interface between the UI world and the net, uh, network work. So, so for example, we use when we are we're developing some of the application. Uh, some applications, the backend w wasn't even finished. Right, oh, oh, you're right. You, that's too far down. I'm talking about you know what the user will see, right? The mockups uh, of the actual user interface. Well, it, it, yes, that, that is kind of the standard process. Like d define the mockup, the screen, w what will happen w when the, when the user will click on which buttons, right? And and then then do the coding. And then we had some pretty good designers uh, take what you did and sort of pretty it up, right? Yeah. yeah. Very good. And Andrew, uh, observations? I was going to say, I mean, we've been doing real simple app design because we can take wireframe drawings for apps. So we can, you want a visual layer that people can understand. So we've been using tools like uh, Balsamic and things like that. It's just really simple UI design tools. And then you can underlay it with the Yang model for getting the feature set in. So we've really managed to abstract away from the class. I mean, I've built many OSSs over the years, and I've hated every single one of them. And um, it, it really gets away from that pain of here's the config snippet, here's what this thing does. It, you, you can just use the model to describe the features and functions just out of Yang. Very basic kind of you know wireframe drawing to spin some of these apps. I mean, yeah, these are small apps, and you're going to need to build really big ones. But the same principles kind of apply. So, it's it's been it's been a really interesting experiment, and, right. uh, and okay. it seems to be working. Excellent. So. Hey, uh, Andrew, uh, back to uh, documentation. Core tutorials. What are core tutorials? What's their purpose? And and. What's there right now, and what do we need? Well, Chris, you know I love doing documentation as an engineer. <laughs> um, yeah. So we've been we've been just trying to put out in sort of plain English from the Open Daylight uh, core tutorials point of view, really simple documentation. So the the first one really is the startup archetype, gives you the ability to basically word for word download a startup template for Open Daylight, and then walk through how to bring this thing up. And also, we've tried to detail what you're doing and why you're doing it, not just press this button and, you know, so we've got some really written in plain English tutorials. We've done another one for Message Bus. There's uh, NetConf Yang one, is on, sorry, NetConf connectors on the way. So, yeah, we're really trying to make this super user-friendly, but we've got to get those explanations in there. It's not just, it's been very bad in the past with, uh, you know, do this thing. We, we haven't told you what you're doing or why you're doing it. So we're, we're trying to sort that out. Very difficult as engineers to, to figure that out, but we're getting there. Uh, Giles, uh, when you start, I mean, you do a lot of, uh, you know, interactions out there with customers that are, you know, wanting to try and leverage this platform to solve some of the problems. W what, are, what are some of the questions or concerns you hear? Uh, be, be honest. Uh, let's, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you mean about what, the platform what, what, itself? Or? Yeah, the platform itself. Um, 
you know, or, you know, scalability, uh, you know, yeah. so what, what are some of the big issues? I think what, you know, one of the big challenges is, you know, those of us who are old enough to remember Windows version 1.0, um, it didn't get a whole lot of use. And I always said right from the beginning with Open Daylight that we'd see mass adoption in release 3.1. Um, release 3.0 is going to come out pretty soon, lithium, so I'm still kind of sticking to that, but the real mass adoption won't happen until we get the first patch release of lithium out there. Because I think you, you, know, you have to have the features, and then you, which is getting to lithium has given us that, but then you also got to have the stability, and that, um, that will get there, but as I say, it's anything that, you know, the first release of a major version, it's great for labs, it's great to play with and develop stuff, but for deployment, you probably want to wait for that first patch release. Right, right. Uh, Yure, how often do you push code into the uh, newest build? Well, uh, we got like the ODL repository, yeah, and then our private repository, and then the apps, yeah, and to our, our private, um, couple times, like five, six times a day, and then to the ODL. Um, it, it, it depends if, if there is some uh, like active development. It, it, it can be uh, between like a couple times a week or, or once a week or something like that. So it varies. And um, or, or, I think we're about ready to release lithium, right? It is, is the, uh, are we at um, what, uh, RC0? What, what, what's the... Uh... Where are we at in the process? We're kind of, what, a couple of months away now, Jan, I think? So we've, we've the, you know, the feature freeze has already happened. We're beyond that. It's now right. testing, debugging. Right, right. Sorry? Okay. Right. Um, Bimmel, a lot of times you get pulled into someone's office um, short notice and, and people tell you, hey, man, I, I need a user interface. Yeah. Um, have you ever felt like, you know, wow, I just don't have enough time to do this? Or has your confidence grown? Or you've got sort of a body of work now that you can maybe sort of leverage. Is that the case? Uh, most of the time, uh, I've reused code uh, a lot of times. Uh, for example, uh, next topology, for example, rendering the topology. The, the, that code literally is copy-paste all the time. And it's just all I've got to change in that case is just the, the URL where I'm getting the topology from. And the other time is it's just the attitude of I just have to get it done. So, yeah, so it's not that bad. Really. Uh, Nicholas, you're talking to some of our road, routing folks, folks about extending your application to maybe work with segment routing or segment routed networks. Right. Um, what, what's what's the deal there? I guess what needs to be done? Um, new models, new APIs, uh, new protocol support. I would imagine. Well, basically, uh, a link state topology is a link state topology. So uh, you just need a way to represent it, and uh, you need a way to program it. Once you have that, you can reuse the backend. Okay. W would there be changes to the? Uh, I guess there's a, a modification to the model, right, to reflect uh, segment routing and. Uh, well, basically, what changes is the distance between nodes. Uh, right. It's not a, called a metric, it's called something else, but you're going to have a node connected to a node, right. you're going to call it something. Yeah. And whenever you have a topology like that, you can derive it and you can, uh, you can draw it. If you, and then if you have a programming point, you can program the uh, traffic engineering. Label stacks, yeah, segment, yeah. Yeah, segment IDs, okay, very good. Hey, um, Yure, uh, under similar circumstances last fall, you were asked to uh, slap together an open flow application under duress and without a whole lot of time. Uh, observations on, on what was involved there, was it easy, complex, were there things in open flow that you discovered, uh, yeah, this isn't going to really sort of do what I thought it would do and now I have to do this? Well, uh, like in terms of, in terms of JavaScript coding, it wasn't so hard. But uh, like to test it out, uh, it, it was a little bit problem because the the OSC was still in development. So 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 I mean, when we were doing the testing, we 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 didn't know if the our calls are bad or, or if it's not implemented yet or if it's uh, fault on the OSC side. So 
so so so this took up a lot of time mm-hmm. that we was like uh, in the dark developing in the dark but I, I think we uh, in the end we managed to do this uh, one time so right so and and uh, now when when the OSC is stable it's uh, adding new features and 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 fixing bug is not a problem at all very good. Hey, uh, Giles, you were uh, mentioning last night, you know, maybe a comparison between Java and REST APIs exposed yeah. by uh, ODL. Some comments there? Yeah, and I, th- I, th- I think a lot of that comes down to what is it you're trying to do. Um, you know, we, uh, when we run things like boot camps or even just, you know, talking to audiences, and if you do a straw poll and say, right, how many, how many people here do we have who know Python or JavaScript? And quite a lot of hands will go up. Well, try it here. How many people do we have who know any Python or JavaScript? So we've got a fair few. And how many know any Java? Can, 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 they, can uh, Cisco HR contact you folks afterwards? Or? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I did this in Milan, and, and Charles was the only person who put his hand up to Java, and he's a Cisco employee. And so that's the first, the first hurdle to get over. I think, I think the second one is just in terms of what is it you're trying to do? The whole, the whole like REST APIs, they are incredibly easy. And back to this thing about you know, uh, consuming JSON in Python, it's just so, so easy. And the productivity you have, Versus with Java, you've got to not just be a Java programmer, you've got to kind of get into the idiom of ODL and how you write those um, access to Java classes that represent Yang models. So writing a, a sort of decent app in ODL to uh, create LSPs um, from the command line, that was one developer for about a week. But for me to write an app in Python to mesh a whole bunch of boxes together using that API was one idiot who doesn't really know how to program for two hours. Right, right, so right. it's so much more productive about that API. The question though is, you know, why, so why do you want to use the Java one? And the, the answer is going to come down to something that needs the performance, it's very closely coupled to the network, where you're wanting to extend ODL itself. So for example, the stuff on, on the message, you know, the event topic yeah. broker, that has to be inside ODL because that's the point. And the same with like a Southbound plugin. If you want a Southbound plugin for a new protocol, that's obviously got to be it, written in Java inside ODL, so there's no choice there. Andrew, back to your message, message bus application and you know the pub, pub sub work you've been doing. Dependencies on upgrading the router OS and challenges. It's interesting. Um, I guess from a, from a dependency point of view, do you mean kind of you know well, how I mean, I'm getting the data or what I'm doing well, with the data? What, what, what will you your capability work? Um, with existing router OSs, or might oh, okay. we need to upgrade the software there? So, no, actually, you don't need to upgrade the software. If you, if you actually don't want to touch the device, or you have a, a very low-powered device that's not going to have this capability, from an open daylight point of view, you just write the southbound plugin. So you can get a couple of things out of that. First of all is you can structure the data at that layer. So you may have a device that is just really dumb and has no structure. And what you want to do is be able to model it into you know, something with a Yang model. You really want to end up with something like JSON as the, as the structure. Then that's, it's a perfect application for a southbound plugin to take care of that. And it's almost the command and control side of that can be the same plugin. It's, it's just, in essence, a codec to program it. And then we can do an end cap on the way up. Uh, in terms of distrib- distribution, that's really down to you've got a message bus, you can subscribe to that as a topic, and we can create those. And then, you know, it's out of, out of open daylight into whatever format you want. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it sounds like magic, but it's actually really straightforward. So, uh, and there's a bunch of SPIs to help you write the plugins and uh, some connector code to get out of open daylight on. It's, it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Hey, uh, Bimmel, I don't know if you've been in touch with any of your uh, colleagues uh, back at university, but do you talk to them and you, do, do you tell them what you're doing and are they aware of some of the things you are doing and where the industry might be going with this? Um, I do speak to some of them. Uh, I know one of my uh, friends at university, he's doing some web development, but he's not uh, working with SDN. So we do exchange ideas um, here and there. Yeah, and he's doing some open source work too. So yeah, uh, Bimmel is one. We uh, Cisco has a program where um, universities will loan software engineering. Uh, what, what's your major, uh, Bimmel? It's computer science. Right. So they'll loan us. Uh, they'll loan them to Cisco for a year, and these folks are tremendous. They come in, and uh, we just throw them into the. Um, uh, into the pool and they, they sink or swim and they, and they always swim. Uh, uh, Nicholas, your experiences um, with some of the folks that you've been working with? Yes, uh, very talented, Qu- quick to learn, doesn't give up, 
If it's on, if it's not inside their head and it's on the internet, they will find it. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So I guess what Stack we're saying is these these new millennials and these these kids coming out of the university, they can be immediately productive, um, and can contribute to uh, uh, to this environment in terms of delivering uh, applications. Um, Giles, uh, last year you were working closely with the BGP yep. uh, developers on ODL. Yep. Given your background in BGP and, you know, inter internet routing designs. Um, your thoughts and, and what were some of the challenges or things that worked? Um, um, yeah, I think it's, it was an interesting process because, you know, again, you have a software engineer who's not really network focused. Um, and I think often the temptation with something like BGP is you either read the RFC and you code the spec. You've got to do more than that to get a working BGP implementation. And we all know that inside the industry, but a software developer doesn't necessarily know that. Um, and I think some of it then becomes horses for courses. Um, you know, one of the great things with virtualization is you can take XRV, you can run XR on a server and get, get the benefit of very high performance BGP implementation. Right. But equally, within open daylight, having BGP there then gives us a great way to interface to that, um, both for the topology stuff that Nicholas works with, but also for programming routes into the network. Um, one thing that I was thinking when we were talking about OpenFlow, I, um, you know, Nicholas said about like uh, Python programmers against XML. That was you, wasn't it? Yeah, the idea of Python programmers against XML. Yeah, I think we mean. should have like an STN engineers against OpenFlow. Sorry, Jan, because um, <laughs> it sucks rocks, and, and I mean, it just blows. And, right. and yet, you know, here we are, and we've got BGP flow spec. Well, why don't we just right. throw it in BGP? Indeed. So uh, yeah, there we go with the uh, classic <laughs> Cisco pro BGP uh, statement. <laughs> Yes. We opened it up, it has BGP in it, yeah. And so you could basically program a flow spec route inside Open Daylight, pass that down into your route reflector, distribute it out through the network with policy instead of having to have open flow and talk to each device individually, which to me seems much better. Uh, great question. So the question was, you know, do we have exa BGP maybe inside of ODL? Right, right, right. And that's the funny thing, people say like, what BGP stack are you using in ODL? And it's like, we wrote it ourselves, come on. So we have a Java developer who's written the code and it's, yeah, it's really good code. But it's, say it is horses for courses, because to me, for your route reflector in your network, use XRV, I mean, the thing scales like a mother, it's designed to. But what you need is the, um, the SDN APIs, and that's where the, the stack in ODL is really powerful. Right, right. Um, good point on the uh, exa BGP. Have there been other examples where ODL um, has worked with maybe other open source components that we side bolt or place underneath rather than, you know, something in the application naturally that runs, for example, um, you know, on, in the UI? Well, we have, I mean, for example, in, in OSC, the Cisco release of ODL, we have used um, things like the whole Elk stack, you know, Logstash, Kibana, different tools like that that are just, you know, open source tools we can plug in to handle, for example, how do you manage logs across a cluster of nodes and make sure they're all synchronized. And all that stuff, and there's so much stuff out there nowadays. It's like, like we said about millennials and going to Google first. It's like before you write any code, you should probably like go to Google and see if somebody already wrote it. Because it, it's always going to be there, right? Andrew, back to, you know, I just having trouble believing that, you know, the folk, the crowd that you used to run with is um, as receptive to this new world of, of software engineering and development a, a, as you are. Well, I think, I mean, my, my background's in being a service provider, so I mean, I'm X level three dude. So, I mean, you've got to just look at where those guys are gone. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's Nick's gone to Facebook, you know, there's Marcus and those guys, they're all at Google. And, and they're all basically adopting the same approach. I mean, uh, Marcus and those guys are working on telemetry. They're, they have no interest in network management as it stands today. They want a completely abstracted view of it that's pub sub. They'll probably do their own controller model, it's Google, so. Um, but you know, Facebook guys are all the same. A lot of folks have gone to Microsoft. Some folks have gone back to enterprise. It's, it's quite bizarre almost how people have just independently adopted the same thought process of, it's, you know, I just said in one sentence, it's far too expensive to manage networks, you know, and that's, that's the big issue. It's not about the equipment. That's a percentage of your cost. It's the day-to-day -day endless running cost of OSS. And, you know, you look, take a controller model and you, you can give it to, you know, these folks and say, build me an app. I mean, that was, that was an integration job over months, days, weeks, you know, and, and uh, now it's down to hours. If we can get the abstraction layer right, both of the device 
and, and, and above it at the sort of open daylight, open source layer. Um, I think it's something you said earlier. I'm just, I know I'm not supposed to ramble. So, um, but it's, it, you were talking about sort of, you know, open source and how's that adopted with, with sort of, you know, when thinking about it from IETF point of view. Is, to me, it's fairly similar. I mean, the whole point of open standards was that it made interop much easier. The, the key thing for me is we're now looking at interop above the devices. And, and that's the piece to me that's really changing with the open source model. And, and that, it's a significant shift. And yeah, and, and a lot of folks are, are, are taking it on board. Sorry, I rambled, but no, no, that's just want to get that okay. out there. Hey, by the way, folks, if you have questions, uh, just shout them out. Um, I'm just sort of, uh, again, tossing uh, you know, questions that, that, um, to these guys. But if you have something that's on your mind or uh, comments or observations, um, Nicholas, uh, you mentioned earlier that you took up Python pretty quickly. Uh, how quick? Uh, it was pretty straightforward. I, I'd done C programming in the past and Pascal and uh, Python is pretty intuitive. Much much more so than Java. <laughs> Would you agree, Giles? You've been doing a yeah, lot of we, um, we had an amazing uh, ODL boot camp uh, that we ran out in Beijing about six weeks ago. Uh, the team, I think, that came second in the boot camp, I was asking them, like, had you guys done this stuff before? The guy who wrote their Python backend code had written 700 lines of Python in a night. He had never seen Python before. Okay, he's kind of an outlier, but, but in general, you can get up to speed really, really fast. H have we hired that individual? Uh, I believe he's going to be doing a PhD in the U.S. next year, and hopefully, I believe he's going to be doing a PhD here in the U.S. next year. Awesome. Okay. So hey, Chris, uh, we should get there's a guy here who wants to ask a question. Yes. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Just a question on um, the Yang models and the NetConf that you guys were talking about earlier, and it's being supported a lot within ODL. Yep. All of the models there. Um, however. And, and that's for application developers can utilize those. But on the southbound side, um, a lot of the networking devices aren't supporting those. And therefore, you know, as a networking guy trying to get people to develop applications using those tools but can't actually talk to the southbound devices, what do you guys see, is, especially in Cisco products? Yeah. Um, there's very limited Cisco products that support a lot of the Yang requirements that ODL requires. And, and how do you guys see that? Yeah, I think, I think there's two, two sides to that, the answer. One is the TLF platform. So that provides a way to get Yang models for your CLI uh, across you know, iOS, NXOS, XR, other vendors' boxes, etc. The other is we've done a, you know, back to sort of open source and, and Cisco adopting that, we've done an awesome thing, to my mind, which is we're now giving away the on-device version of the TLF software. So the, the basic comp D that runs on a device that they used to sell to vendors who wanted NetConf Yang support on their device, we're now giving that away. So I've been working with one small vendor recently who has a box, they want to get NetConf Yang on their box, so I'm working with them to get it on there using that software. So, and that will be, that's free to them. They just need help to figure out what to do. So just a follow-up, so, so how do we what is, what is the documentation? Is there documentation available for taking that and getting it onto iOS devices that we have? Or so with iOS, that will be a challenge because you, you really probably don't want to be writing code inside iOS yourself. Right. Um, now I believe there is, you know, there is work going on there that I'm probably not at liberty to disclose right now. But but um, you know it will come, and I think the best way it's going to come and the soonest way it's going to come is if you guys beat us up. Well, beat up the BUs for us. Because if I go to the BEUs and say, I need this tomorrow, they're not going to listen. But if a customer comes and says, I need it yesterday, the BE might, you know, that's going to accelerate it. I think, I think you've also got to consider what's the shortest path to getting this done. So as, as Giles said, you've got TLF to take care of you know, a lot of those sort of iOS devices. But if you have a particular you know, device that just has no support, the shortest path is probably not to go back to the legacy device and try and find some way to retrofit this new technology. If, if, if you've adopted the controller principle, it would be to write a southbound plugin to take care of that. Because I, I only have to write that plugin once. I can do it almost independent of a vendor. And in fact, I, we have one PK for a good example. Right? We have a couple of customers that have said, are you going to write this plugin? So we have a debate with them. They're like, ah, do you know what? I can get four guys to write it in a month. I'll do it myself. So you know, we're getting people to do, well, not customers are doing this on their own. They're saying, it's just shorter for us to do it. We'll own the plugin. You know, we can develop all the feature set that we want, and they're going to open source it. So, you know, it's it, it's really working that open source model. Unfortunately, without the mic, I'm only getting bits of it. I'm getting the word XR and NetConf. Sorry. 
But well, uh, yeah. Chris, did you did you catch the question? Yeah, Sorry. NetConf exists today, right? Yeah. Yes. Let me take left. Uh, it works. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Nicholas. So, so we, we do have a product that can do that. So, so the, the TLF and SO product can work as a southbound between open daylight and the product. Yeah. But it's, it's not public source or open source. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're, we're getting to the end. I'm going to go down the line and I want you, uh, each of you guys to tell me what's good and what's not so good or what would you like to see, or well, good and not so good and then what would you like to see with respect to developing and delivering applications on top of ODL? Uh, Giles, we'll start with you. So the good, not so good, what would you like to see? The good, as I say, I think, I think just the whole concept of this and, and how much easier your life is once you have NetConf Yang versus, and you know, RESTConf Northbound versus writing spec scripts. And that's just great in terms, and it's the whole productivity improvement. I think not so good. I guess we touched on documentation before. Yeah. And I think then there's always that trade-off. You know, I want these features that are only in lithium, but it's not quite stable yet. Versus, right. And just that sort of stuff and navigating it. Sure. What would you like to see? I'd like to see. Um, wow. Um, come back to me on that. I'll think of something by the time you Okay, we'll come back time. to you. Bimo, the good and uh, the not so good. The good is how easy it is to develop uh, applications for ODL, because you don't need to be a great programmer. Uh, and the not so good part is the documentation for some of the frameworks. Okay, what would uh, you like to see? A more straightforward documentation. Gotcha, so yeah, a lot of on documentation. Nicholas. Yeah, uh, when I started uh, playing around with this probably a bit more than a year ago, I uh, didn't want to use XML, so I had to reverse engineer the JSON calls, mm. and the documentation was absolutely horrible. Wow. Um, what Andrew said today is absolutely true. It's so much better today. Do we have anybody from the ODL community? Are you hearing this? Documentation. Hey, uh, Nicholas, uh, what would you like to see? Better documentation. Better documentation. Yeah, better. And, and also, I'd like to see NetConf and all Cisco products. Oh, there you yeah. go. Well, uh, yeah. How about out yeah. there in the industry? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Yuri, the good and the not so good. Uh, the, the good thing is that uh, working with the Yankee models and the REST APIs is really easy. The bad thing is that ODL is still in development, so not everything works all the time. And what I would like to see, I would, I will go with documentation too. Very good, Andrew. Okay, so all right, from from, from the good, I would say the industry is converging on a standard modeling language, uh, and and so that that that's moving towards Yang. It seems to be that everybody likes that. Um, and I'll, another good, which is relevant to that, is that we don't necessarily need to standardize every model. So this is, this is once we've got a modeling language, we can get out of this classic IETF standardization takes three years approach. But, you know, so that's, that's the good. Um, I'll, do a, I'll do a scary rather than a not so good, because I can't honestly yeah, think please, one at this yeah, point. No. So I think, I think from, if, it's kind of scary, but I think it's exciting. I think from a network engineering point of view, people are going to have to retool. So, you know, it's an industry that, of people who want to move forward. So on the scary side is people really are going to have to start to move away from CLI. The skill sets are going to have to change it a little bit to, to kind of adopt this approach. So we're, we're going to see some pushback from folks that are very happy where they are, but I think it's very exciting and, 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 and it's, you know, I'm enjoying learning it. I'm, I'm not the world's greatest programmer, but it's, you know, Fantastic. it's a scary bit, but it's a good scary. Hey so. folks, uh, thanks very much for coming. Listen, these guys will be here all week. We've got plenty of places where we can go into details and deep dive on some of these applications. We have a lot of apps that we've uh, delivered and des designed and delivered on top of ODL and we'd be happy to uh, share with you uh, some, some of our experiences and uh, maybe even help you install it and get you going. So uh, thanks to our panel. Thank you, Chris. Guys, great job. Now start hacking and uh, we'll, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Chris.